today we are wrapping up our series on praise. And this is the series that is opening up 2020 for us. It highlights our theme for this year of the one word praise. And we're going to be talking about, God willing, throughout the remainder of the year of how to live out some of the ideas that are clearly seen in this verse we're about to read and also some of the ideas that are tucked away and a little more hidden. We want to explore all the thoughts and the ideas and the faith that we see in this verse. Our guiding verse for this year is Psalm 34.1. And it just seems so simple on the surface. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. And it may be really easy for us who have grown up in, in the church world or maybe for us who are, who are accustomed to relin- religious language to just look at this and say, it's, this is nice religious rhetoric. It's, it's good for singing and worship. It, it's good for the religious world, but it's not what this verse is really meant for. It's meant for a shift in life. It is meant for setting the direction of how someone is choosing to live. To say, I will bless the Lord, is an extreme turnaround. Here is an intentional shift in the way someone lives in which they say, I will be a blessing to God. That I will live my life in such a way that it will be an offering to Him. That it will be pleasing to Him. That it would be honorable to Him. This is choosing a direction for life. Rather than saying, God, help me, God, take care of me, God, bless me, which are all good and fine prayers, and we need to pray them and live them. What an interesting shift to say, I will bless the Lord. A choice is made. The direction for living is set. And that's why we've used this phrase in our first few weeks, and we'll continue to hit it here and there again as we go throughout this year, that praise is alignment. It's taking all of our words, all of our choices, all of our actions, all of our passions, our mind, our body, our soul, and it's putting them into a Godward direction where everything about us is saying, I will be honorable to the Lord. All of my life will be a blessing to the Lord. Not just what I do and say on Sunday, but how I do my job through the week, how I take care of my responsibilities, how I love one another. All of these things will be lined up in such a way that they will be a blessing to the Lord in how I handle them, how I take care of them. So that's the idea. Praise is alignment. But then if we think about it, that should also naturally come up to the next step, this question of how do we create alignment? This is a nice idea, and this is what what we maybe want to aim for, getting everything in our life lined up toward God. But how do we do that? How do we create alignment? Alignment. Last week we talked about the beauty of the Lord. That the more we see the beauty of God, the more it will create within us a desire to love Him. And out of the desire to love Him, we end up doing the good that He calls us to do. And it's not that we're trying to keep the rules, it's just that we just love Him, and so it naturally begins to flow out of who we are. We do things that are pleasing and honorable to Him. But sometimes we don't always see the beauty of God. Like we talked about just a moment ago after singing the song, Good, Good Father, sometimes we don't see the beauty of the Lord. Sometimes we don't see the goodness of God. Sometimes our gaze has shifted to other things. And this doesn't mean that you and I are bad Christians. It doesn't mean we love God. It's that sometimes we are discouraged. Sometimes we go through situations that frustrate us. Sometimes we deal with circumstances that stress us out. And maybe we have problems and challenges that we have to try to solve in life and it ends up emptying us emotionally and spiritually and we feel flat and empty. And at those moments, we're not enchanted by the beauty of God. We're just too discouraged by the distress of this world. So in those moments where we don't see the beauty of God, we're not going to be feeling and expressing love toward Him. It's not that we're necessarily disenchanted with God. It's just that we've been distracted by other things that are pulling us away from the beauty of God. I guess maybe a simple way of saying it is we can take the goodness of God for granted. Uh, 
we can become so accustomed to the goodness of God that we stop thinking about it on, on a constant basis or on a continual basis. And so we get distressed, frustrated, and discouraged by the things we see in the world. And then that makes us more distressed, more discouraged, and the beauty of the Lord fades to us. I want us to look again at our guiding verse, Psalm 34, 1. I will bless the Lord when? At all times. So that's going to include times in which we're discouraged or disenchanted with the beauty of God or disenchanted with the goodness of who He is. To bless the Lord at all times means that even in those moments where we don't sense or feel the goodness of God, His praise shall still continually be in my mouth. There has to be something that will help us create alignment so that even when those times in which we're frustrated, angry, or hurt, we're still able to say, I will bless the Lord. Or we're still able to say, His praise shall continually be in my mouth. I want us to fast forward from this verse. Roughly 1,100 years later, from the time when David in the Old Testament, wrote Psalm 34.1, we're going to go to the New Testament and we're going to see what Paul wrote to the church in Thessalonica. And I want us to notice how similar the ideas are. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, at verse 16, Paul writes, Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do you notice the similarities? These guys are on the same path. Both of these guys are creating alignment in their life where they're praising the Lord at all times. His praise is continually in His mouth. And, and Paul is saying rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. They're really talking about the same thing, aren't they? Both of these men have aligned behavior. Paul, look at his behavior. Rejoice. Pray. Give thanks. These are expressions of a heart that is in tune with God. These are the actions of a soul that is focused on God and is able to remain enchanted with Him even always without ceasing in all circumstances even when things aren't beautiful around us. This is what alignment looks like. It's continuous. It's constant. It's a habit. It's habitual. It's normal. For David and for Paul, separated by over a thousand years, their heart is on the same page. They're saying, this is the way we want to make our lives happen. Day by day, moment by moment, we want to rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and give thanks in all circumstances. To do this requires an intentional real shift in the way we think. It requires a real turn. And how do we create alignment? How do we create this shift in the way we think? I think it begins with what we notice. Because I really believe that if you and I want to create alignment, the way that you and I are going to begin, and this is a simple thing to do, the way that you and I need to begin creating alignment is to start being more grateful. Nothing will create alignment with God and bring our attention back to God and our gaze back on the beauty of God like gratitude. And when I see Paul's words here, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, that give thanks I think is the key. Because if you and I start noticing the good more, we begin to see the beauty of God more. It begins to draw our attention back toward Him. It begins to create alignment in what we feel. Sometimes life begins to snowball on us. Maybe we have a few moments in our day that aren't very good. Maybe we have a frustrating phone call. Maybe we have a, 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 a bill that comes in. Maybe we get, get something that pops up in our responsibilities that we have to take care of and it disrupts all of our other plans for the day. And those bad moments suddenly snowball and we don't just have bad moments. We get home and our spouse asks us, how was our day? And what do we say? It's terrible. How just a few bad moments suddenly change a whole day. And then maybe you have a couple of bad days together and suddenly what does it feel like? 
Oh, I just can't wait for this week to be over. Well, I promise you that that feeling snowballs too, and you've been there, that suddenly a few bad days turns into a bad week, and before long the bad week turns into more than one, and then you have a growing sense of frustration in your life that it's not happening the way you want it to be. And then some of us are party animals. We start feeling frustrated, and what do we do? We throw a pity party. Woo-hoo! And then suddenly our frustration grows. And then we become not just unhappy, we become bitter. Why does it work that way? That the moment we stop thinking about the good and give even a little attention to the bad, it suddenly wants to grow and just take over the way we see the world. It's like it takes on a life of its own. And then before long, we become people who stop thinking about the good we have and we just start thinking about what we wish we had. How easy it is for us to focus on our unfulfilled desires rather than our fulfilled desires. How easy it is for us to start thinking about what we don't have rather than what we do have. The more you and I focus on what we don't have, the more you and I focus on our unfulfilled desires, our unmet needs, the more they seem to grow and they take on a life of their own. And that's the opposite of blessing the Lord at all times. We instead will be people who say, I will complain at all times. My moaning shall continually be on my mouth. My unhappiness shall forever continually be expressed. Oh, and then it's only a matter of time before your unhappiness begins to take a different shape and you start looking for people to blame. Probably the people closest to you will be the ones that will take most of the blame because after all, they're closest to you. And if they were better to you, you wouldn't have this unhappiness in life. Ingratitude suddenly can become an acid that eats away at our most wonderful relationships. Ingratitude changes the way we work at our jobs. It changes how we face our responsibilities. It changes everything in our lives because it slowly becomes this, this stain in our soul that we can't enjoy anything we do have because we're just overcome with the things we don't like. But gratitude recognizes the good that we do have in our lives. It doesn't ignore that there are things in our lives that are imperfect. Gratitude doesn't live in denial. It doesn't just put a happy face sticker on the face of misery and says, it'll be okay. No, no. Gratitude recognizes there is real pain and suffering in this world. We don't diminish that. We don't ignore it. It's there. We acknowledge it. We recognize it. And we deal with it. But gratitude also recognizes that even at the same moment that you and I may be struggling this is still a world with much beauty, love, and goodness in it. Gratitude is the intentional shift of our gaze to see what is good, beautiful, true, lovely, honorable, virtuous, blessed. Oh, and then it takes the next step. Where does this goodness come from? Gratitude recognizes the existence of goodness and then it recognizes the source of that goodness. The New Testament book of James, chapter 1. James is the half-brother of Jesus. Same mother, different fathers. James became a convert to Christianity after he saw Jesus rise from the dead. And years later, here's what James would write about the goodness of God. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Meaning He is always constant. He is always bright. He is always steadfast. And He is always good. I wanted to highlight the word. The very first word in this verse is what? Every. It doesn't say that most good gifts are from God. It doesn't even say that some good gifts. It says what? Every good gift. Every good thing that you and I have enjoyed in life, the goodness from that at its source comes from God. Everything. Everything that has ever brought delight to you at its source 
the goodness was from God. Sometimes it goes through a lot of different channels before it comes to us, and it may come to us in some odd ways, and maybe even some ways that weren't necessarily God's first choice. But I promise you, the source, the beginning of every good thing that mankind enjoys is God. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. So we recognize goodness in our lives. We intentionally look for it, and then we consider, where does it come from? Oh, maybe, maybe you want to push back a little bit on this. And you may say, you know, I have some good things in my life, but they didn't come from God. I have good things in my life that I enjoy, and it comes from me working hard and sacrificing to get there. I agree. But go another step farther. In the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, chapter 8, verse 18, the Scripture says, You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you power to get wealth. So I hope you work hard, and I hope you you handle your responsibilities well, and I hope that it helps you accumulate wealth. But understand that if you take another step back, that the one who gave the ability to do so is God. The goodness of God comes in one of two ways. It either comes directly or immediately, meaning God gives us that primarily through no other source. God just gives His goodness Sometimes we feel that. Sometimes we sense it. And and we can tell that God is is doing something wonderful and working in our soul. And it's a beautiful thing. But most of the time when we experience the goodness of God, it comes through a secondary cause. It comes maybe through some other act, some other person, some other means. Now it doesn't lessen the goodness of God. It means that God is choosing to cooperate with somebody or arrange circumstances in such a way that goodness comes through them. So when I have goodness uh, 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 in my life and I feel like, you know, I've worked hard to be able to enjoy this. This is a good thing. I can say, and maybe I worked hard for this and maybe I did the right thing and it's paying off. But I also need to recognize that the ability to work hard and the opportunities that, that I find in life, they're gifts from God. Even if you have somebody else that is generous to you, God's working in their life to bring generosity from them to you. If somebody else puts a smile on your face, recognize that that smile that they're giving you is a gift from God working through them. It's all around us. Recognize that all goodness is evidence of a good God. If you're an atheist and you say, but there can't be a God, goodness is just random, then what makes it good? It's just an accident, really. If there is no God, then whatever goodness you feel is actually an illusion. It doesn't exist in anything more than that moment, which means it's meaningless. And if it's meaningless, how can it really be defined as good? If there's no God, there's no ultimate source of good or bad. Everything is just an illusion. It's just a matter of perception. And your perception is just meaningless because maybe you can call good evil and evil good because what does it matter? It's meaningless. There's no depth to it. It's just an emotional feeling. There has to be a source of goodness for it to be meaningful. Whenever we see goodness, we're seeing evidence of a good source. There's a creator, a sustainer that is supplying good to us. You want to practice alignment? Practice gratitude. Look at the goodness around you. Intentionally look for it. And in fact, the more you feel the weight of this world, the more intentional you need to be about practicing gratitude. And I want to emphasize the word practice. Like a musician practices their instrument. Like an athlete practices their skills. You practice something, you're repeating behavior, you're refining it until you get better at it. And before long, you get so good at it, so accustomed to practicing it, that it becomes a habit. It becomes a part of the way you live. Very few times in life do we actually intentionally practice gratitude. And that's why sometimes we have to be reminded to be grateful. Slow down. Say thank you. We have to be reminded of this because seldom do we actually intentionally practice gratitude like we're going to get better at it. That this needs to be something that is a routine part of our life. 
I think there are few things that will create alignment in our lives quicker than gratitude. It intentionally turns all of our passions, all of our attentions, all of our thoughts toward God. And the more you and I are practicing gratitude, the more we're practicing the act and the art of aligning our life toward God. Romans chapter 12, there is a scripture that tells us how easy it is to be overcome by what is wrong. Romans 12, 21 says, Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Do you feel the, the, the pressing weight of evil in your life? Do you feel the stress and the struggles of darkness in this world? Don't be overcome by it. Don't give in to it. Don't let the weight of discouragement and the stress of what is wrong crush your soul. Resist it. And how do you resist it? Overcome evil with good. Turn your attention to what is good. Let that be your focus. Remind yourself that bad is not more dominant than good. Remind yourself that the bad may be getting your attention at the moment, but the good deserves your greater attention. It's choosing to say, I will resist the evil that I see by turning my attention to the beauty that is greater the goodness that is stronger, the goodness that will overcome. This is a choice. It has to be practice. This isn't just something that we make a one-time decision and we say, I'm more grateful now. It isn't just something we feel in our hearts and we say, I, I, I feel grateful for the life God has given me. No, you have to practice it. Because here today, in, in the comfort of our worship space, it's a lot easier to say, I'm focusing on the good. I feel it. I see the beauty of God. I love God with my heart and my mind and my soul. I, I love Him that way. But then once you and I are out of this place where our attention is intentionally put on Him, it's easy for our gaze to shift somewhere that drains us. We have to practice turning to see the good. Solomon in the Old Testament wrote most of the book of Proverbs contains lovely little hints of wisdom and teachings of wisdom here and there. Here's one that deals with what we're talking about. Proverbs 11.27 says, Whoever diligently seeks good seeks favor, but evil comes to him who searches for it. So if you search for evil, what are you going to find? Evil. Uh, let's put it another way. You're going to find what you look for. If you look for reasons to be mad, you're going to find it. If you look for reasons to be upset, disappointed, frustrated, hurt, you're going to find it. And when you find what you're looking for, you are essentially embracing it and you're proving to yourself that you were right. If you are a person that is starting to look for all of the negative in the world, you will find it and then by finding it, you reward yourself mentally by saying, see, I knew it. Yeah, it's just the way the world is. It's funny how we will reward ourselves for our own thinking. But the same concept also holds true for good. If you and I are intentionally seeking good, we'll find good. We'll find favor. And it begins to be a wonderful loop that says, Look, see, I told you there was good. You just had to look for it. There is intentionality here. Seek good and you'll find it. This has to be practice. So let's talk about how we practice it. The idea of becoming grateful is actually very simple. Some days it's going to be more difficult than others, but this is actually something very simple to do, and it will begin to create momentum in your life, I promise you. So here's what we have to do. We have to see it and speak it. I almost wanted to use see something, say something. And then I thought, where have I heard that before? Like, oh, that's from the government, the, the TSA. You go through the airport. So I don't, want, I don't want to use that Sunday morning. See something, say something. People start looking for abandoned luggage. You know, so, so we're going to see it and speak it. Would you repeat this with me, please? See it and speak it. Here's what I mean by this. See something good and talk about it. See the good things and say it. Discuss it. Pronounce it broadcast it, see it, and speak it. Don't just see something good and in your heart say, oh, that's nice. Express it. 
So here's three things that I want us to do to help see it and, and speak it. The first is express it. A lot of times whenever we are grateful, we're really talking about a feeling that we have. We feel grateful for what someone else has done for us. We feel grateful for what someone means to us. We feel thankful for what God has done for us. And a lot of times that's the end of our gratitude. But I want to tell you that gratitude isn't very powerful when it's just a feeling. Because it really doesn't change anything. The feeling will pass. If you and I feel grateful, let, let, let's say that we, we feel thankful for what someone means to us. Or maybe someone has done something nice for us and we're grateful for that. We feel that, but then the feeling evaporates and we move on to the next emotion, the next feeling. So the gratitude there isn't really very powerful. But the gratitude becomes more powerful when you express it. When you say it out loud, what you're thankful for. Maybe the next time someone does something good for you, say thank you. Say it, speak it, write it, sing it, rap it, dance it, whatever. Express it. Then the next time your spouse does something good to you or good for you, express gratitude. Your wife made a lovely three bean casserole. Express it. Yo, baby, that casserole was the bomb. <laughs> I don't know if a three bean casserole can be the bomb. But, I mean, you, you get the idea. Don't just feel it. Don't just say, oh, that was nice of her. Or, oh, that was nice of him. Express it. Once it is expressed, it begins to become more meaningful. You'll also notice that when you express gratitude, it does something to someone else. And that's the next thing that I want us to do. We don't just want to express it. We want to direct it. Direct your gratitude toward God. Say thank you to God. But also say thank you to other people. Direct it to them. Express the gratitude toward the source of that good and toward the secondary cause, the means of the good. That your spouse does something good to you. You recognize that God is the source of all good things and you're thanking Him for it, but you're also thanking the person who has done good things for you. Direct it to them. Look them in the eye and say thank you. Look them in the eye and let them know you appreciate the effort behind what they did. Because sometimes when people do good things to you or for you, maybe you and I just take it for granted and we don't recognize the power behind what they did. When you think about it, when someone intentionally does something good, that's not for their benefit, it's just a benefit to you, that means they've made some sacrifice somewhere of a degree or a measure of time and energy to do good for you. It was an act of love. Even if it was a small act, it, it was an act of love. So there's power behind that. When you respond with gratitude, it amplifies the power behind it. It reinforces that goodness should be pursued. It reinforces the whole idea that goodness is worth celebrating. It grows. It takes on a life of its own. But if someone does something good to us or for us and we just feel it in our heart, it ends there. Gratitude is a way of continuing the life cycle of what is good. Express it. Direct it. And number three, specify it. Be very clear. Be very specific about what you're thankful for. Say exactly what it is that you are grateful for. Thank you for taking the time to tell me how you feel. Someone does something nice for you physically. Maybe your son takes the trash out without being told for the 17th time this morning. He just does it on his own. I mean, I've heard these things happen. I don't know that for real. But, but say... Thank you. Th thank you for noticing that needs to be done, and thank you for taking the initiative to get up and do that. I appreciate that. That saved me some moments of my time. Thank you. Express it. Direct it. Specify it. And 
listen, it doesn't have to just work in, in family and people close to you. It needs to be. That's the best place to practice it. But take it farther. Take it to your coworkers. They do something at the job that makes your entire work environment better. Thank them for it. Specify it. Say this, this is making this a better place to work at. Or this made this task a little bit easier. Take it farther. Take it to strangers. Someone working the cash register at the quick stop or at the grocery store looks you in the eye and smiles to thank you for doing your job. Thank strangers. Express what you're grateful for. I mean, it doesn't have to get all weird and whatnot. Express that you notice the goodness that they did. Thank you. What would happen in our lives if we practice this? If we practice expressing it, directing it, specifying what would it do to our own soul to continuously be in the habit of looking for the good, acknowledging it, and expressing it? I promise you this. You would feel better. You'll make someone else feel better. And you will start bringing your life into alignment. Because before long, you're living your life with an intention, with a Godward direction, because you recognize that He's the source of all good. So I want to end this morning's message with a challenge to you. This is gratitude challenge. Now there's two ways that you can record this challenge. Inside of your paper bulletin that you physically were handed on your way into the building this morning, or you can do this digitally on the app. We have our bulletin there as well. And I have a, 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 an insert or an outline of, for taking sermon notes. You can do it on there too. But if you flip over your note page in the bulletin or you scroll down on the sermon notes in the app, you'll see the gratitude challenge. And you'll see a little box there for Sunday, Monday, to all the way through next Sunday. Here's the gratitude challenge. Every day, beginning today and ending next Sunday, although we don't really want to end, this is the last day you have to record it though, record at least one time that day where you have acknowledged and specifically expressed gratitude to someone else or to God for good that you have received. I want you to intentionally challenge yourself to be on the alert for good that others do or that you sense in your spirit from God and you express it, you direct it, and you specify it and then record it. This is what practice is like. You say, well, I'm not a writer. But you can be. Even if it's, uh, Joe did good, period. I said thank you, period. You're written. Yay! Now, I know that that's a fictional story. Joe did good. But work with me on this, right? <laughs> Make it simple. The first thing that requires you to do is to keep your eyes open for good because you don't want to go to bed at night and you've not met the needs of your challenge, right? <laughs> what a loser. <laughs> you want to go to bed at night and you want to say, I have met the challenge today. I have done what I'm supposed to do. And you fill out your notes on the paper or you fill out, out on, the, on the app and you email it to yourself. You're making a record of it. This is what people who practice things do. They make it routine. They make it normal. It doesn't matter whether you're talking about an athlete or you're talking about someone skilled in their, in their, in their task, their job, whatever. This is what people who practice things do. They do it daily. And this is a simple thing for you to do, but I promise you will have great rewards. So I'm going to ask you, that if you will commit to the gratitude challenge for this just one week, and please feel free to go farther if you want, that if you will commit to doing the gratitude challenge, you'll see it and speak it for one week beginning today, would you say amen? amen. I am grateful for that response. Thank you, all of you, for staying awake for this message and then expressing your gratitude and your challenge acceptance. I can now fill in my note for the day. <laughs> now I'm going to ask our musicians and our singers to come. And they're going to lead us in a time of worship. In this time of worship, maybe it's going to be a little bit different than how we often end our Sunday morning messages. Now, if you're here this morning, you've never become a Christian, this is a great chance to do so. Right where you're at, you can ask Christ to come into your heart. 
or we encourage people, please see one of the pastors after service. So we're calling you to make a change in your faith. But this is also a different kind of worship response. When we stand and we sing together in a moment, can you specifically start to name off some of the things in your life that you're thankful for? I mean, just go down a mental checklist. I am so thankful for the person. Name them in your mind. Name specific things. Are you thankful for where you live? Are you thankful for where you work? Are you thankful for the country you live in? Are you thankful for the car that you drove out to church in this morning? Or are you thankful for the device that you can watch this message on, this service on online? Are you the specific things that you have in your life? If you and I stopped to count all the good things that we have in our lives, I think we'd be amazed at how good we've got it. That even when we go through hard times, even when we suffer, it's not the end of all goodness. It's a moment. So when we stand and we sing and we pray in a moment, let's make this an offering of gratitude that we're blessing the Lord beginning right here, right now by recognizing all that we have to be thankful for. Let's stand together as we worship and sing. Heavenly Father, we are grateful. We also recognize, or I recognize, God, that so often I have taken Your goodness for granted. I've just overlooked how good you are, or how blessed I am. And I've grumbled and complained about the smallest of things until they became, in my mind, the greatest of things. God, forgive me for that. May you soften my heart and my soul that I would be more sensitive to the goodness that you have put in my life all around me. Father, I would be quick to see it recognize it and give you the glory for it. God, every day I see evidence that you are a good, good Father. Every day I see evidence that you are worthy of it all. So Father, today I intentionally choose to see your goodness. Thank you for what you've done for me. Thank you for what you've done for us. We love you, God. We know you have flooded our lives with good things. So God, we want to flood the world with gratitude to you. Thank you for what you have done. Thank you for what you will do. Hi, I'm Greg Stevens. I'm one of the pastors here at Liberty Hill Church. And I want to thank you for watching this message and invite you to connect with us further, especially if you have questions or if something in the message touched your heart and you'd like to speak to a pastor about it. You are welcome to reach out to us. You can reach us on our website, libertyhill.church. Or you can find us on Facebook or Twitter or on Instagram as well. And we'd also love for you to worship with us live and in person here at our church in Dexter, Missouri. And uh, you can worship with us at 9 o'clock or at 1030. And we would love to connect with you there. Tell your friends about our website. Tell your friends about our messages. And we hope to connect with you and see you again soon.